Do, do you want to see Huck's back? Yeah, I'd love My would. back and Huck's tattoo. Exactly. Huck's balding. The collaboration? All tattoos are shot collaboration. Yeah. Tom's back piece is probably the most incredible tattoo I've ever seen, and it, it was the dragon done by Huck Spaulding. I believe in the late 60s that tattoo was done. And when I first saw that picture, I was like, Jesus Christ, you know? I mean, the tattoo world was so tiny that it's, it's just, you can't even convey how unusual it was to see any tattoos, you know? The only people with tattoos either been in jail or in the service. And then seeing big workers just blew my mind. You know, he forced Huck to do that that size. He blew that up from the Coleman Dragon. And I guess and Mike said that Huck really grumbled about it. He didn't want it. It's too big, you know. Tattooing years ago was a lot different then. I mean, totally, totally, totally different. Nobody got big back pieces back then. He was ahead of his time. At that time, tattooing was very underground. There were very few places where you could learn about it. And especially if you're a kid here in New York, when it's illegal and it's underground, there's no place to learn. And then he went up and got tattooed from Hawk. And then Hawk Spalding helped Bob get started. And that's all you ever did was help somebody. You didn't teach anybody anything. DeVita takes Malone and Kate Hildebrand upstate where Hawk is tattooing. And Malone takes pictures. He told me that he was a photographer and he was so blown away by the tattooing. This is what he wanted to do instead of being a photographer. This is a photograph of Mike Malone sitting in Tom's chair on 4th Street. They became very, very good friends. And you know, it's who opens the door for you and who turns on the light is, is the greatest, one of the greatest parts of your career. If you look at Malone, it always starts with Sailor Jerry. And that is absolute, a big crock of bullshit. Uh, DeVita was responsible for Malone getting in tattooing for sure, you know. And I had started corresponding with Malone when I was still at Doc Webb's in the first couple of years in San Diego. And then Malone and I really got along, you know, I had a lot of similar things. And I was like, oh, I'd like to see New York. I'd never been there. Anyway, my first trip to New York was in, oh Christ, man, 70 maybe 72, spring of 72, because I was tattooing a bunch of wealthy people that lived there that were getting custom work, like big businessmen type that were in the closet sexually and in their closet with the tattoos. No, you know, they were positions of importance. And the, the night I got in, they had a, a party at this person's apartment. And then Malone had said, oh, wait till you meet DeVita. And then Malone was talking about DeVita's place and said, you won't believe it. Tom's place was, I'm going to say, it was a dangerous area. The East Village was a bad place in the 60s and 70s. Very dangerous. He was on 4th between C and D. Yeah, C and D, coke and dope. I mean, that's what it stood for. Oh, yeah, where are you going? Uh, you know, because it was very dangerous down here for one thing at that time. I mean, it was totally ghetto. It was all drugs. I mean, that's the drug capital of the world at that time. Can you imagine what it was in the bad neighborhood? That's where I live. We go down to see DeVita, we get in a cab, and I said, we're going to fourth between C and D. And then we got going down fourth, and then finally, at about Avenue A, he said, I'm not going any further. I won't take any further. It was like Berlin after the fucking war. It was like burnout buildings and shit. It was just totally crazy, you know? If you look at Lower East Side, Lower East Side has changed the history of America probably 500 times with the different people that have come through here. I mean, it's been massive. You know, like Rothko had a studio down here, Jackson Pollock, Jimi Hendrix, Madonna. I mean, it's just kind of endless, the number of sort of creative people that have come out of the Lower East Side. And the connection to that and the root to all of that was cheap rent and inexpensive lifestyle. On, on 4th Street, the shop was on the top floor. I lived downstairs on another floor. But the only thing is that Tom, he only took five people a day. And you had to be there at seven in the morning. I mean, you got there at seven in the morning. There was people waiting for him on the stoop, you know? I used to tell him, you can wake me up at any time as long as it's the light out. 
just call out my name very softly and I'll hear you because that's when I wake up. I'll be ready in one hour. You had to walk through his apartment, which was kind of darkly lit. Uh, so you didn't really get to see anything, but it was very mysterious looking. There was a lot of things there that were like, you would want to stop and look at it just out of curiosity, but he didn't give you a chance. We followed him into what was his, what was the kitchen of the apartment where the tattoo shop was. And when I walked into that place, my mind was blown. It was walking into a work of art. A lot of this stuff was, was there then. Tom had the best sign I ever seen. Like I said, he used to go out at night and look for things. It said, no bongo drums or percussion instruments are not in the park after dark. You felt like you were walking in an art gallery. I kind of envy that. I wish I had a shop similar to that. He would get flash from people, and those things were all presented on the wall. The sheet itself was like embellished with like ink and stamps, and they would paste things on them and put frames around them. He changed everything. In fact, he used to say, our job as artists is to change things. Geez, I think like it wasn't until years later you started seeing things like that in like the Lower East Side galleries. Things like the collage kind of constructionism. You would see things that look like what Tom had been doing 10 years or 15 years ago, you know. I never met anybody that was in tattooing that was like that at all. He was working on grape crate slats because he said, well, it's perfect. It's like the size of an arm. And I just was, I said, this is your flash? And he says, yeah, this is what I do. And then I said, what if they want a hot stuff? Because he didn't have any cartoons. And in those days, all of us were like, oh, shit, more cartoons. You know, paid the rent, but you just get so tired of them. And then he said, yeah. He says, well, I tell him I got to get his dad. And he had a big Hanya, you know, big Japanese dude. I don't like cartoons. All that Mickey Mouse tattoos. I started in California. I mean, tattooing is already cartoonish. Why, why make it so obvious? I like tattoos that look like tattoos. And it just blew my mind. I was like, well, you mean you don't like have to just give them, you know, like the, the main menu? You know, I was still tattooing sailors. I was trying to put on, get people to get something different, you know, custom work. I'd work for almost nothing just to get to do something different, you know? It just changed my head around completely. As I saw this stuff, I didn't have a plan yet to do a, a custom shop, to do what I eventually did with Realistic. You know, then I went to Japan, I shut down the San Diego shop, and when I came back, I opened a place where everything had to be one of a kind. And I fucked it up for a lot of people because then I started going, well, hey, we can do whatever you want, you know, and a lot of tattooers were not into that. Then I started inching the prices up, and then when I came back from Japan, you know, I was, started getting more here at Realistic. And then David would have all this, yeah, these signs, tattoos need not be expensive. And I'm going, Tom, you're living here in a fucking, you know, burnout building, you know, on this neighborhood where, you know, you, you don't have any overhead. I said, Jesus Christ, I got a family, I'm paying rent. You don't even know what it is to be in the real world, you know. So we were always going back and forth about that. I just have a sign saying, artists pay double. <laughs> yeah, that's true, he did. Were you known for your designs? No, I was known for $30 tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big room filled with $30 of tattoo, but, that, but I had the smaller room that had higher priced tattoos. They were $50. They were 60 Then it, then it went a to 90 dollars room and a $30 room. No, 60 30 I can't figure out numbers that easy. So I made it 30 60 90 <laughs> Caught on pretty quick. People weren't coming around to get collector things from him. I mean, he was almost completely doing like the neighborhood guys. He was in a Puerto Rican neighborhood, so 99% of his customers were Puerto Rican. So I'd go down there and I'd roll my sleeves up, you know, because I had these same tattoos on. And so even though you're like a Howley guy coming down in there, you know, and if anybody said anything, we said, we're going to see the tattoo man, you know. Or sometimes people would say, you're going to see the tattoo man? I'd say, yeah, you know. I walked down there and they'd say, tattoo, tattoo man. The marker in Spanish, man, it does the marks. 
Puerto Ricans just came by like the Russian guys, just come by and got a tattoo. People I tattooed didn't have their bodies done. Just their arms. Just, uh, they want an eagle over here, they wanted a heart over here, mom and dad over here. That's the kind of people I tattoo. I had designs on the walls, but nobody picked them out. I was doing blue collar workers. And guys who didn't work. Is that the monkey king? Yeah. You've done it, this one that's before. That's not typical of the work that I would do. Blue collar guys don't come up for, for a monkey king. Plumbers don't want monkey king. That's you true. understand what I say? Yes, sir. And no customer ever come in and said, I want clouds, I want water. Couldn't sell them water. I would sometimes tell them, would you like a little some clouds around the eagle? Make a minute. Yeah, okay, you know. I wouldn't even charge them for it, hoping maybe they'd get out and somebody would come back and say, I want clouds. Then I'd say, well, that'd be $30 extra. Another thing that I loved as a formal breakthrough was he would put that stuff on and then he started to, so he'd have like the panther, right? The standard panther size. He'd have the panther, but then, then he'd do like the claw marks and he'd say, see, then it fills up that space, you know? Or he'd do the big, you know, the big spider webs behind it. He was always trying to wipe out a, wipe out, I could wipe out a whole forearm with that. He'd put stuff around it, you know, by the time he was done for 30 bucks, your whole goddamn forearm was covered. I know his, Reasoning for it was to make people think they, they were getting more for their money, you know, even though they were only paying $30 for this tattoo, but really it, it's a dynamic look that really can't be faked. You're just like stunned, like, wow, look at that. That's, that's strong, you know. If this was like a traditional situation, Tom would have probably never gotten into tattoos. The only reason that Tom would be able to become a tattoo artist and be the tattoo artist he is is because he was in a place like the Lower East Side. They thought, wow, it's a great tattoo. They're not part of the classic tattoo lineage, so they have a tattoo which they think is powerful and great and unique, but it's for this section of people who are drug dealers and junkies and whatever. Tom would be nowhere without that. To me, it's high art in the, some of the craziest conditions. He was bringing to that neighborhood what people could afford, and it was illegal too, so you know, he, there was risks at every corner and turn. And, I, and he's just doing this really beautiful stuff and it's, he's like really was a tattooer for the people at that time and I think that's so cool. And I think people really liked him for that as well and respected him for that. There was one guy, Puerto Rican, his name was Ralphie. And I'd done quite a few tattoos on his arm. So we had no electricity and no air conditioning because so the one who was in control of the basement shut it all off. So I had to go, so Jenny went out and bought me short pants. And Ralphie's standing on the corner, and he couldn't believe that my legs, you know, they're solid. He looked, and he was so stunned. He said, Tom, he pronounced the, the, the H in Tom. Tom, I don't even know how to do it. But he pronounced the H. He said, Tom, we are proud of you. <laughs> I said, Tom, he says, we are proud of you.